On the night of the 10th of January, 1860, a series of announcements were sent from a reporter in Lawrence, Massachusetts, to the Associated Press. These announcements chronicled one of the worst industrial disasters to take place in the history of the state, live as it unfolded. The first, sent at 6pm, read, One of the most terrible catastrophes on record occurred in this city this afternoon. The Pemberton Mills fell with a sudden crash about 5 o'clock while some 600 or 700 operatives were at work. The mills are a complete wreck, and some 200 or 300 are still supposed to be buried in the ruins. At present it is impossible to give anything like a correct account of the loss of life, but from the best authority, it is believed that at least 200 are dead in the ruins. At midnight, another update was delivered. Within the past ten minutes, the whole mass of ruins has become one sheet of flame. The screams and moans of the poor, buried, burning and suffocating creatures can be distinctly heard, but no power on earth can save them. And at 1.30am the following morning, a final terrible note was received. The Pemberton Mills are now a flat, smoking mass. Brick, mortar, and human bones are promiscuously mingled. Probably not less than 200 human beings perished in the flames. The fire made quick work, burning not only the main buildings as they lay flat, but spreading to the material that had in kindness been removed. These dispatches chronicled the collapse of the Pemberton Mill, and the horrifying toll of the fire that subsequently swept through the wreckage. In the days that followed, dozens of stories would appear in local and national papers, detailing the miraculous survivals, the harrowing deaths, and the frantic rescues that took place in the hours between the collapse of the mill and the fire that followed. Here are a few of them. Some exhibitions of heroism and presence of mind accompanied the spectacle of the excited multitude. Miss Olive Bridges, who worked in the fifth story, seized the hoisting chain of the elevator and went safely down five stories to the ground and escaped from the building without injury. Through the whole night she was at the city hall, passing like an angel of mercy among the couches of the sufferers, anticipating every want, relieving pain, and breathing words of comfort and consolation to the wounded and dying. Several others saved themselves by the same means, performing feats which, for coolness in danger, did them infinite credit. Henry Nice, a brother of Thomas Nice, whose wife was killed in the ruins, relates an interesting narrative of his experience. He was employed in the boiler house, and at the moment of the disaster was engaged in putting a wick into a lamp. He heard a noise which he cannot describe and stood up for an instant, when he was struck on the shoulder by a heavy article. He thrust himself head foremost against a door opening outwards and fell into the porch, the door and the space about him being instantly filled with brick, and his body confined to the most uncomfortable limits. A cloud of steam and dust penetrated the debris and nearly suffocated him but by almost superhuman efforts he succeeded in digging a passage through the ruin and reaching a place of security. Instead of fleeing from the scene of the disaster, he turned back to rescue those still living. Upon the floor of the card room he found a girl who boarded at number 5 Pemberton Corporation, who subsequently informed her rescuer that she was alone in the country, but had a mother in Ireland. A piece of shafting lay across her neck, her knee was seriously lacerated, and the rim of a roping can was pressed into her back. Nice obtained a saw, and cutting away the boards and timbers from under her, had the satisfaction of seeing her borne away to a place of safety. He then continued the work of rescuing his unfortunate companions. Darius Nash, the third hand in the spinning room, fell with the factory. Nice heard him scream for help, and creeping on his hands and knees amid the tangled ruins, he found Nash and a young girl lying close together. The latter was cheerful, and urged Nice to remove her companion first, as he was lying on her leg, 
being confined there by a spinning frame which rested on his side. Nice thrust a strip of board through a hole above him, which attracted the notice of others, who cut a hole in the floor, through which Nash was drawn badly hurt. Every effort was made to remove the machinery which imprisoned the heroic girl, without avail, and the fire sweeping over the spot, her young life went out amid the scorching heat. On Tuesday evening, before the fire broke out, while 2,000 men were exerting every energy in rescuing the survivors from their living sepulchres, and the dead from the rubbish which buried them, a party came upon the body of a little girl. She lay apparently crushed beneath a ponderous block of iron, weighing over a thousand pounds, and which covered her body to her chin. Her back was pressed against a huge timber, one of her arms was thrust to the elbow through a ring in a piece of machinery, and she was completely wedged in by heavy iron gearing. Intent only on preserving her features and form as little disfigured as possible, the men laboured carefully to remove the block of iron without crushing her still further. Four of them tugged upon it, but could not stir it. After they had made several ineffectual attempts, a stalwart and athletic man in passing caught hold of it and, with marvellous power, aided by the excitement which the scene produced upon him, he succeeded in loosening it. The other rubbish was then removed and the body taken out, when, what was the surprise and joy of the men to find that they had rescued a living girl instead of a corpse, and more, that her injuries were not fatal but comparatively trifling. The heavy iron had met with some more powerful obstruction than her body, and her life was spared as if by a miracle. Had the pressure upon her body been but slightly increased, or had the least carelessness been allowed in extricating her, she would have been another added to the list of victims. Among the ruins, an opening in a portion of the floor was shown which is a witness to the noble conduct of Mr. Fox of the Washington Corporation, and another gentleman, while the fire was spreading from the place where it caught, they were actively engaged in the labour of rescuing persons and trying to extinguish the flames, when they heard cries issuing from the basement storey, near the centre of the south side of the building. On proceeding there, they found that two girls in the basement, entirely uninjured, had been blocked in by the ruins about them. They tried in vain to gain access to the place where they were confined, and as the flames were rapidly approaching, a death of torture seemed before the poor unfortunates, whose piteous cries greeted their ears. Finally, they procured a saw, and after persevering labour, succeeded in cutting a hole through the solid floor and extricating them from it. A boy at work in one of the upper rooms, hearing the crash, had the presence of mind to jump into a waste box which, with its occupant, was buried several feet beneath the ruins. When the rescuers raised the pile of rubbish from the box, the young hero sprang from his narrow prison and walked away as coolly as if nothing had happened. Another boy, who had acquired the use of the dudeen on being extricated from beneath a mass of machinery, walked away, took a pipe from his pocket, and went to smoking. Three young women, Members of a family of seven, named Luck, were all in the mill at the time of the fall, all of whom escaped without serious injury. One of them, Jane Luck, after being buried five hours beneath the ruins, was rescued without receiving so much as a scratch. Anna, one of the oldest sisters, was standing near her loom when the crash came. She instantly threw herself under the loom and called to Elizabeth Fish and Philia Barnes to follow her example. They did so, and were, all three, saved. One of the engineers of the fire department related the following. When the fire was beginning to rage, and before it had stilled the cries and groans of those in the ruins, he, with others, forced his way against the smoke and flame to try and rescue some of those whose voices he could hear. Suddenly, he caught a glimpse of three persons imprisoned by a crumbled partition, two men and a woman. He even seized one of the men by the hand, and hoped to draw him out, but the crackling of the flames around him, and the warning voice of an officer, impelled him reluctantly to desist, and by a timely retreat, 
to save his own life. Neither of the three persons appeared injured at all, and they must have literally roasted alive. I got nightmares in my head, I fear That the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills